University of Kent joins me now. Matt, thanks for joining us today. So yourself and David Rosado, is that right, have created this report. Yeah. What are the key findings what, that are most uh, pertinent and interesting? Yeah, so a couple of years ago um, in the United States, there was this big debate about the so-called great awakening of media. And mm -hmm. people were pointing to places like the New York Times, the Washington Post, and saying, well, why are we now talking only about identity politics? Why are we only talking about race, sex, and gender? And David Rosado's earlier work showed this explosion in references to those terms. Mm. And I sat there looking at this debate and thinking, well, that must be unique to the United States. Well, let's check that out. Yeah. And I decided to work with David and say, well, why don't we look at UK media? And actually what we found was the exact same thing. In fact, if anything, UK media has become really more obsessed with these terms than the US. And, and I think actually this has got some pretty profound implications for the country and also for the media. So has this come about because of what we call the culture war? And I remember reading a number of uh, a while ago now uh, that The Guardian and many economists for The Guardian often claim the culture war is a right wing myth. But they came out at the top of the people who mentioned the phrase culture war more than any other publication. Yeah. Now, personally, I don't like the phrase culture war because I think when we're talking about women's rights or children's welfare. I don't think that's a culture war. But that's true. We found that media on the left of the landscape was much more likely over the last 20 years to use terms like racism, transphobia, homophobia, but also a more specific set of terms that we associate with woke politics or social justice politics, terms like slavery, cultural appropriation, white privilege, whiteness. And over the last 20 years, basically what you've seen is this vocabulary of wokeism or social justice ideology has essentially gone mainstream. It's right. more prominent on the left. It's also prominent on the right, largely in response to these debates that we've seen. But I would argue it's now disconnected from the reality of the world that we live in, that lots of things like racism and uh, homophobia have declined sharply over the last few decades. Yes. But yet at the same time, our national conversation about those things has sort of been put on steroids. And I think we need to ask some questions about, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah, I mean, I think that the phrase culture war has become a kind of shorthand for this current, uh, these current debates about social justice in particular, because obviously every era has a different form of culture war. And sure. this, this is, I suppose, ours. I mean, does that, from what you're saying there with the findings, does that imply that really this is something that has been generated from the left wing media or at least certainly perpetuated? Yeah, so the Americans are having the exact same debate as us as to what's behind it. I think there's a few things. Um, one is the way in which the media model has changed. We've become focused on, you know, clickbait media, which has got to be more moralistic, sensationalist. You know, take all of the uh, stories over the last week about issues around gender identity and so on. These are really important issues. People want to talk about them. They also generate a lot of activity, so the media then invests in them to a greater degree. But actually, I think a bigger factor is how the media class itself is changing. Mm. So we also know that compared to the 70s and the 80s, uh, journalists in the UK, like in the US, are much more likely now to be university educated. Over half of them now have gone through Oxbridge and Russell Group uh, universities, where typically these ideas tend to circulate more prominently than they do in other institutions. And I think there's a case to be made, actually, about the media class has become not just more insular, but more disconnected from the rest of the country and yes. perhaps has invested in this belief system, which, as other academics have argued, has become something of a status symbol that, you know, a lot of uh, people now, um, for example, um, uh, colleagues at Cambridge have argued, uh, Rob Henderson, among others, that, that woke ism, social justice ideology for the elite, has become a marker of status. Yes. That whereas 30 years ago it was about showing your wealth and your, your ability to have luxury time and so on, today it's about your awareness of terms like cultural appropriation, white privilege, and that has become a new marker of your social status relative to others. And the media class, I think, have, have really embraced that. I mean, certainly there's an undeniable correlation, isn't there, between uh, the... the uh woke politics and the middle classes. I mean, it's, it's, not, sure. it's not a particularly yeah. working class thing. You know, no. you, you don't find working class communities caring so much about which pronouns you use. This is a, a very middle class thing. A lot of the main proponents tend to have double barreled surnames. And then you, you get uh, within the media a disproportionate number of privately educated people. So is money and class really at the heart of a lot of this? I think it goes a long way to explaining why we're seeing these remarkable trends that we're seeing, that you do have this much more elite media class um, 
to put it in an, another way, if you go back and you read some of the books by Andrew Marr and other prominent journalists who have talked about what the, the media was like in the 70s and the 80s, they talked about people coming from local newspapers. They talked about you know, working class reporters not passing through university, a, a diversity of views, right? Yes. Today, that is much less the case. So journalists, senior journalists say to me all the time, well, the problem today is the young journalists that are coming into the newsroom have not only come straight from, from Oxford and Cambridge, and that's OK, they're great universities and so on, but also they view themselves as activists, mm. not as journalists. So their priority is not about objectivity, finding the truth, independence. They often view themselves as being there to change the world, to yes. be activists rather than journalists in the traditional sense. And when Barry Weiss resigned from the New York Times, in her resignation letter, she made that point, that we no longer see ourselves as people who are investigating to see what the truth is. We see ourselves as an elite group who have the truth, and it's our job to dispense that to the players. Right. But I don't think that's sustainable now. So if you look at the growth of, say, Barry's platform and um, you look at the, the, the number of people who are joining Substack and those kinds of uh, places... GB News, um, you know, unheard, the sort of flourishing of the media landscape. Um, I think now for the first time really in, in recent history, we are going to have a financially um, independent, politically independent uh, media that is not going to be beholden on the established institutions. And I think that's going to be a very important counterweight to what we're seeing now on the left and the right of the legacy media. And what do you make of, I mean, we've seen with the Tory party leadership contest recently, uh, various publications, uh, particularly on the left, talking about how these issues of social justice are a mere distraction that have been invented by the right to draw us away from the realities of economic inequality, the cost of living crisis. A lot of that is coming from the very publications who your report reveals uh, bang on about social justice issues all the time. Isn't there a, a hypocrisy there? I, I don't find that narrative um, particularly convincing coming from, from those media outlets that this is a sort of you know, right-wing culture warriors that are creating this. If you look at most of the prominent campaigners who have been dealing with these issues around free speech, uh, women's rights, uh, children's welfare, they're not exactly you know, right-wing you know, male conservative culture warriors. I mean, they're often no. you know, prominent women, uh, diverse backgrounds. Left-wing feminists. Left-wing left kind of feminists, yeah, et cetera. And um, the debate, in many respects, over the last two weeks within the Conservative Party, if you look at what Kemi Badnock wrote only yesterday in the newspapers about, you know, pulling back the curtain to reveal her experiences of the civil service, you know, the point she makes is, were it not for many left-wing, gender-critical uh, uh, feminists and scholars, then um, she wouldn't have felt that she, she could have done that. She, yes. would, she felt she wouldn't have had the strength to do that. So the debate is very much coming from a different um, place than perhaps some of those newspapers and media outlets would have us believe. But do you think their, their, their power is lessening at this point? Because, I mean, you know, you've described all these various people who are very prominent, who are certainly not from the right. But there, there has been a, a habit amongst culture warrior activist journalists uh, to say that these people are, in fact, right wing. Yeah. And to, to, even though they're not. Uh, yeah. Is that working anymore? Do they have any authority? Well, I think you could see that playing at playing itself out with the conservative leadership debate where people pointed at, you know, Rishi Sunak, Swella Braverman, um, Kemi Badenoch and said, well, you know, they're not real um, members of minority groups. You know, they're not the right. ones that really count. They're the sort of, you know, the fake ones, the pretend ones. Um, so I think the, the narrative and the belief system that comes with social justice has actually been weakened in quite a serious way. Now, if you're an optimist and you you think this place we're in is a very divisive place and politics is becoming polarised, you'd look at the events of the last couple of weeks, the things that you've talked about on your show, and you'd say, well, maybe actually the dam is beginning to break. Maybe actually we're going in a better place where we can talk about freedom and, and free speech and these things in a more mature way. Of course, a counterweight to that, which is why I'm still a pessimist, actually, in this debate, is the generational divides that we see on these issues. So mm. if you look at you know, the, the extent to which young Zoomers, my students who are born in uh, 2003 from Generation Z, how they see the world relative to the older baby boomers yes. uh, who are now, you know, entering or in retirement. I mean, it's a fundamentally different outlook, right? They're much more likely to prioritise many of these um, sort of social justice ways of seeing the world. Yes. Uh, so I think the debate that we're having is, is really just beginning, actually, and I think it will accelerate. I mean, to what extent do you think uh, a lot of this is, is the fault of the universities? Insofar as you say that people come out of universities as activists, they probably weren't when they went in. So is there something to be said for that? Yeah, I mean, we've also looked at the university 
um, issue in a, in a previous report, and I was also advising the government on the need to shake up universities because I think they have become much too um, invested in a particular ideological worldview. Mm. So we've got about 80% of academics in the UK lean to the left politically, and we know that those who lean to the right or hold gender critical views or maybe a different view of British history, we know they're much more likely to experience political discrimination on campus and they're much more likely to self-censor, to hide their views on campus. Um, so we do have a problem with the universities, both in the UK and across Western uh, democracies. And that's why actually I'm quite thankful that the Conservative government, and I'm you know, not, a, I would not here to make a political point, but the Conservative government in the UK was the first government to take academic freedom seriously and to put it onto uh, the agenda by bringing forward a bill that would try to um, promote and preserve um, the viewpoint diversity that we need on campus. I don't want my students only having one particular ideological worldview on campus. I don't think that's very healthy. But given that, as, that, as you found in your reports, the higher education is so ideologically captured and, as is the media, and we are experiencing perhaps what we might call a legitimation crisis. We no longer trust figures of authority because we know they have an activist agenda. And one of the aspects of this particular woke movement and the people who subscribe to it is their tendency to disregard the truth in favour of what they would like to be true. Now, if the people in authority are willing to, well, let's say it, lie uh, to misrepresent the worldview uh, in order to proselytise, um, can we ever claw that back to a condition where, you know, university is about the production of knowledge and truth yeah. and the media is about telling us what's going on, not telling us what to think about what's going on? I think we have a fundamental problem with many of our institutions and I think the primary goal has to be to try and get a much wider range of voices and views into those institutions. And there's lots of ways you can do that, but the primary objective, I think, now is to look at the media, look at universities, look at political parties, look at the civil service, and actually now start to ensure that they don't just represent what is probably a view held by 13, 15% of the country, but they're actually now representing a much larger slice of the country. And I think there are lots of ways you can do that, but that to me is a priority. Well, very interesting stuff. Matt Goodwin, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it.